booktube science fiction reads here with another edition of recent reads uh this past week i read three novels by chad oliver who was an anthropologist as well as a science fiction and i believe western writer and uh he wrote a lot of short stories but only i believe nine novels at least one of which was um a young adult or like a juvenile story his first book so um i can't even remember how i came across um his work maybe talking to sean stanfast about archaeology in sf and then that led me on to anthropology or something i can't remember anyway i asked sean stanfast what he thought of chad oliver and he said he was good and underrated so nesfa press who's really good at um publishing, uh, like, not necessarily forgotten work, but stuff that's good and out of print, basically. And Chad Oliver is certainly uh, out of print, aside from the Nesfa, uh, Nesfa Press books. So they did two short story collections and then one omnibus of three of his novels. I recently read all three in here. Um, two are from the 50s and one from the 70s. So... Uh, the first one is probably my favorite, Shadows in the Sun, which was published uh, in 1954. And uh, kind of the funny thing is, a lot of the times with his stories, the main character is an anthropologist who's like 220 pounds or something and six feet tall from Texas, which is apparently uh, an identical um, description of Chad Oliver himself. So I like that. He's basically putting himself in the story. That's kind of funny. Um, and a lot of the stories have connections to Texas. Possibly all three of these. I can't really remember now. But this one certainly does. Uh, the main character in Shadows, uh, of Shadows in the Sun is Paul Ellery, who is an anthropologist who kind of got a grant um, to go explore just some small American town. I think there's a few anthropologists doing this. And kind of just study what small American town life um, is like. Uh, yeah, it would be a town. It's only, I think, a population of 6,000. Um, I'm not going to find that info now. I'm a pretty small town in Texas called Jefferson Springs. And it basically starts immediately uh, with the character. Pretty much from the first page, you learn that um, Paul, the anthropologist, uh, is not sure what's going on in this town because everybody seems strange, reluctant to talk to him. Uh, and he digs deeper and he finds out that nobody living in Jefferson Springs currently um, lived there more than 15 years ago. Like everybody who was there 15 years ago moved out. And all of these people seemingly are, uh, within the last 15 years, fairly new to this town. So it's like a completely revamped town. So almost from the beginning, he's lost interest in uh, what he's supposed to be doing there. And he's just trying to solve this mystery. Uh, and there's one of the more prominent farmers in this town. Uh, he drives out to that guy's place because he's determined to question him. It's one of the guys he's questioned before. Um, but now he's just kind of frustrated and he just wants answers. So he goes to this guy's farm kind of late at night and he witnesses something descend from the sky in the backyard and five people get out uh and he thinks about it he goes to the house knocks on the door questions the guy um the guy's totally just a normal farm doesn't know what uh paul every is talking about um denies any any of paul's claims and uh sends him on his way and so paul ellery the uh, anthropologist starts digging deeper and deeper into this um i don't know how spoiler spoiler uh, I want to get, but he does, uh, it's a very interesting, all of these are first contact novels, and it's very interesting in that he does make first contact with these people, because they are not exactly human. Um, and rather than um, trying to dig for answers the whole time, they pretty much answer all of his questions once he reveals that uh, he's kind of figured something out. He's aware that this town is not what it seems. Um, and after a while, the, <laughs> the powers that be are kind of like, all right, Paul, 
we're just going to tell you everything you want to know, uh, so you'll leave us alone, because nobody nobody's going to believe you anyways, so you'll probably keep it to yourself. Um, so he does make contact with the people of Jefferson Springs who are not actually human. They are and they aren't. Uh, and it was really good. There's a lot of um, reflection on the human condition. And uh, at the end of the book, Paul has a big decision to make. Um, he can either um, kind of join this galactic society that's hinted at and learn as much as he wants for as long as he wants, or he can just go back to his regular human life. And the second half of the book is really him trying to make this decision, like, how can, how can I go back to my normal life when I know there's so much more out there um, and I can never talk about it? Nobody would ever believe me, so I just have to keep it to myself. Um, but how can I pass it up? How can I pass up learning about a thousand other cultures um, who are human-like? Uh, and the only thing I did not like about this is his ultimate decision, which is right at the end of the book. Um, they give the answer to his question in the foreword, because there's a foreword for each of these by another author. Uh, let me see here. An author I've read, uh, George Zabrowski. He has an introduction for all three, and I didn't, you know, I didn't expect a spoiler, but he gives it away right in the foreword. So that was a real piss off because I knew the whole time what his choice was going to be. But it was really good, and it did not read like a 1954 novel, aside from the mention of one girl's car being a Nash. So uh, that tells you you're in the 50s, uh, American 50s. Uh, and it was good. So that was actually the second one I read. I read the middle one first, which was called Unearthly Neighbors from 1960. Again, we have an anthropologist from Texas. Um, he's he's not the greatest anthropologist in the world, but he's quite prominent and uh, famous. He's currently a teacher at a university. And uh, a representative of the UN knocks on his door one day and says, um, the space program has found a nearby planet with a very human-like species. Um, all they did was take pictures. They did not make contact or anything because they wanted to do it proper. They need an anthropologist. And so they've come to this guy whose name, um, oh, I can't remember it now. Let me find it. Monty. Monty, Monty Stewart. But he's kind of an eccentric guy. He's got a pipe, which um, I guess Chad Oliver smoked a pipe all the time. So Monty goes to this planet, and the big mystery here is they appear human aside from like a really large jaw and uh, eerily long arms. And they have a language, they talk, they, they live together, but they live in caves and small settlements, but they have no material culture whatsoever. Um, no tools, no weapons, nothing. Uh, can't remember. I don't think there's even signs of farming, really. Um, or if there is, it's it's super primitive because they have no tools. So his big mystery is, um, can these people be considered human? Uh, and could humanity uh, from Earth live like this? Would we still be human if we lived a totally um, non-material life and culture? Uh, and the first contact in this one does not get off to a good start, but he's determined to uh, right some wrongs, make contact. Um, he does solve... Uh, the mystery of how these people live this way. Um, and I won't give away anymore. That was good too, but it was probably my um, third favorite of the three. So the last one was the most modern. It was called uh, The Shores of Another Sea from 1971. And this, not an anthropologist character, just trying to find his name. Royce, yeah. Royce is uh, an American living uh, in Kenya, far from uh, any of the main towns, like 50 or so miles from any populated area, which is more than a day's drive due to, you know, poor road conditions and dangers and whatnot. He is working for an American research company, and he works at a baboonery, I think that's how you pronounce that, where he basically captures baboons uh, and ships them back to the States for medical research. Uh, and then one day while he's out on a hunt um, with some of his uh, African staff, 
they witness kind of a weird streak in the sky and a strange sound uh, and don't think much of it until some of the caged baboons back um, at his workplace disappear or are uh, killed. Uh, and then one of the uh, staff members also disappears and they find him dead nearby. And then strange things happen. Um, baboons start showing up at the perimeter of the property, showing strange intelligence. Uh, and this starts to creep Royce out. He also has his wife and two young daughters living with him for, I think maybe it's a two-year contract or something, or he's been there for two years and he's got a little while left to go um, with the option of staying longer if he wanted to. Uh, so, um, not really, I'm not sure why this was included because he has other novels that involve um, first contact that reflect more, I think, on the human condition and what it means to be human. There's not much of that in this. This is more of a mystery um, that really reminded me of Roadside Picnic. Despite Royce kind of making a first contact, um, there is actual first contact with um, some strange intelligence that he thinks is um, has landed in this, you know, the middle of Africa because it would be a good place for an alien intelligence to um, start to learn about the planet and its inhabitants. Baboons are close to humanity, so if they're trying to, I don't know, he's not sure if they're trying to uplift baboons or just try to figure out how they work or if they are possessing the baboons with their own consciousness and then spying on him. He's, it, there's a lot of uh, contemplation. He's, he, he doesn't know for sure. And we never really know for sure either what they're doing. And so in, in that sense, it really gave me roadside picnic vibes because despite actually meeting uh, the intelligence sort of and making a sort of contact, you never know. You never find out what they were doing, what the whole point was. Um, and it was neat. It was again like the first one where this guy has this experience and ultimately is just going to have to keep it to himself. Uh, and in this case, the few other people who know because... Um, no one would ever believe him. Uh, it's just something that happened. But in the end, uh, despite this first contact getting off, again, to a rough start, he sort of thinks he may have um, made some sort of impression or there might have been some sort of mutual understanding between him and this alien intelligence, which again is super vaguely described, only one close encounter. Um, and then they, near the end, kind of, he witnesses just from far away that they're flying off um and again it's cool you don't even know if they're leaving the planet or if they're just well our operation's been compromised let's you know fly 200 miles this way and we'll start over with another uh isolated area so basically um i really enjoyed these i gave two of them three out of five and the other uh, uh the first one a four out of five they were really good before this i had only read one uh chad oliver short story because I have one of the other Nesfa editions of his collected short stories, volume two, I think. Yeah, so there's another one. Um, the only thing I had read from him was a short story in here about like a model train set that this kid sort of plays with, but is starting to lose interest. And the little toy figurines are actually sentient when the humans aren't around. So it's a very Toy Story type thing. Um, and those little toys kind of resent the way this kid treats them. And they <laughs> they kind of plot to, I don't know if they want to kill the kid or just hurt him or something, but it was really bizarre, kind of creepy, but neat. Very, very different from this stuff. This stuff was really good. Um, I know it'll be a pain and a struggle, but I want to track down some of his other stuff. Um, he's got another book with wind in the title, uh, The Winds of Time from... 56. I have it on my computer over there. That one I want to read. That involves a guy, I think in uh, Denver, finding some hibernating aliens in a cave. And he wants to help them. Um, but humanity, at this point, does not have the technology uh, to repair these guys' spaceships. So he kind of hibernates with them into the future. I think that sounds cool. I want to read that. Um, but good luck finding a copy. Um, I looked on eBay, but I'm not willing to spend the money on books right now. Uh, which is why there's no uh, new books in this video. But yeah, I would recommend uh, Chad Oliver, especially Nespa Press um, books. 
their cover art is either awesome or not so great. This is not a very good, um, you know, Photoshop creation with these different things just spliced together. Although it does represent an actual scene um, from the first story where the uh, anthropologist is trying to figure out these town people um, or this whole town of Jefferson Springs and are they a cult? Are they alien? What are they? He's an author that I believe was recognized and celebrated in his time in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but over time, um, for whatever reason, has kind of been forgotten uh, somewhat. Not entirely, thanks to uh, Nesca Press. I love these guys. Um, so I would recommend him uh, if you're into anthropological SF and reflections on uh, the human condition and, you know, all that good stuff. Um, as always, thanks for watching and see you next time.